Aloha. Welcome to Finding Your Peace of the Rock on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Abe Lee. I have been licensed as a real estate agent since 1973. I'm the owner of Century 21 I Properties Hawaii and work with close to 100 wonderful real estate agents in sales. I started ABD seminars in 1980. I have taught over 11,000 students to get their real estate licenses and taught continuing education classes to licensees to help them to maintain their real estate license every two years. Our show is dedicated to helping buyers and sellers understand the process involved in real estate transactions. Our special guests will talk about legal issues, escrow, title, getting a loan, surveys, home inspections, insurance, contracts, wills and trusts, and much, much more. And today we have a really great guest who's a CPA and a realtor and a surfer and a motorcycle biker. If you can imagine one person here and a dog lover to boot, okay? So his name is Mike Bates, a good friend of mine and a wonderful person. So Mike, thank you so much for being with us today. Happy to be here. Great. So we're going to start off as we normally do. Tell us a little about your background, where you're from and where you grew up, your education, family, etc. Okay. Well, I was born way back in the last century in Seattle, Washington. Uh, lived there briefly. My mom was from Hawaii and my dad was from California and uh, they got married and had me there. And I lived about uh, 18 years of my life in the mainland and then moved to Hawaii on the big island where my mom is originally from. And from then on, that was about 1980 and I've lived here on various islands, primarily Oahu ever since. So tell us about your background because your work background is very interesting. Okay. I uh, majored in accounting at the University of Hawaii. Uh, after you major in accounting, the next step is to pass the CPA exam and then uh, get a job working in a CPA firm to eventually earn your CPA license. And I did that in the early, uh, uh, late seventies, early or late eighties, early nineties. And I, I got, uh, eventually got licensed and it's, uh, working in a CPA firm is that you learn a lot and you also work a lot. And, uh, a lot, a lot of people, um, like myself, when they get the CPA license, they go off into private practice working as a chief financial officer for a company. And I worked for two companies. I worked for a company that owned what used to be the Kaluakoi Resort on Molokai. And then I uh, came, I, I started off in Honolulu working for that company. And as the Japanese investment bubble popped, I was physically relocated to uh, Molokai for a few years. And that was, it was cool, but it was also pretty rough being away from friends and family for uh, Monday through Friday. And then I came back here and I worked for a trucking company for a few years. And uh, I had my CPA license, or, sorry, real estate license from 1994. And around 2000, I just figured I'm going to go into real estate because CPA work is too hard <laughs> for, the, for the amount of money you make. You really got to work hard. Well, good. So you got your license before you even activated it, so to speak. Yeah, the Kaluakoi Resort had land to sell and mm. the owners wanted me to get my real estate license just for general knowledge. I didn't do any sales there, uh, but that was a blessing in disguise because as I eventually got burned out on working for uh, private companies and CPA firms, I was ready to move into selling real estate. Okay. So when you got your real estate license, where do you start off? And what what has been your progression in your real estate career? Um, I started off uh, not doing very much for quite a while, and uh, just primarily friends and family, a couple transactions a year when I was lucky. And around that time, uh, real estate internet activity was just picking up, and I got the idea to get leads by. Uh, building a, a real estate website. And there were just a handful of companies that had good websites uh, at that point in time. So I did that and um, it, it was it was not very hard at that time because there wasn't a lot of uh, competition. 
So I had some pretty good years with uh, real estate leads and I still have a website and still get leads. It's not the same as before though, because almost every realtor has a website now. But I know you specialize in featuring special uh, neighborhoods at a time, like Hololo or Kailua or Kaneohe. Mm -hmm. And I know you got a lot of leads because people were interested in those areas. So really you're one of the pioneers in doing website blogging, so to speak. Yeah, I could say that I didn't invent the ideas, but yeah. I've, I've uh, emulated them and copied them. And as you know, I, there was a time when I had a lot of business in Makaha. Yes. Uh, I did a lot of, so when I remember one month, I did about eight sales in Makaha and there, you know, they were small, so I didn't get rich off of them, but it's, it's good to have business. And then hopefully you pick up some of those, uh, when the owners decide to sell, when the buyers become sellers. Right. And so I, I've gotten a lot of, uh, business from people coming back and Pololo. Yes. I, I, uh, specialize in Pololo. I have a lot of knowledge about Pololo because I've lived there for 16 years. Um, also I'm, uh, getting, um, uh, more and more information about Hawaiian homelands. Mm -hmm. And those are pretty tough because of the finding qualified buyers, uh, not only financially, but on Hawaiian ancestry. And uh, there's just a lot of issues. Dealing with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is very difficult. So it's challenging to get the job done. And uh, um, the clients are really appreciative though. Sure, you bet. Good. So Mike, um, tell me what's some important things that you do when you work with a client? Because they understand that you're a CPA, so there must be a degree of trust. Because they did a Gallup poll years ago and CPAs were considered to be one of the most trustworthy professions, along with pharmacists, if you can believe it. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. But what do you I, do I when you meet with a client? I don't necessarily tell them I'm a CPA right away because some people already have accountants and have been, or they might have the information in on their mind already, or they already have an accountant advising them. If they have questions, so about, for example, the capital gain exclusion, how long you have to live in the house before you can sell it and, and qualify for the capital gain exclusion, then I'll tell them that. And a lot of times people aren't clear about 1031 exchanges. They think they can sell their residence in 1031 exchange into another residence. And so I'll, I'll help them and then I'll, I'll, I'll ease into the, uh, I'm a C CPA. And another, another big thing is HARPTA. Any non-resident, U.S. resident who's not a Hawaii resident is uh, generally, there are exceptions, but there's, uh, they're generally subject to HARPTA, HARPTA, which blows them away. And I explained that HARPTA is almost always too high. I've, I've never had someone who I worked on, on their uh, HARPTA refund where they didn't, they didn't get a refund. They, they're never under withheld, they're over withheld. The HARPTA rate is 7.25% of the selling price of the home. Yeah, so you know, the federal government with the FERPTA is what fifteen percent, mm -hmm. and then there's another seven and a quarter percent. So that yeah. poor consumer, I'm not consumer, but the foreigner gets whacked for a huge amount, and they usually yeah. will get a refund unless they bought it really early and they have tremendous appreciation. But if they don't have that, then they'll get a refund. Yes, that's right. Yeah, good. So at least you specialize in that area. So mm -hmm. Mike. What do you advise your clients as far as record keeping is concerned? Because I know in real estate as anything else with a business that you have to keep good records. What kind of records do you recommend that you say owner and occupants keep and then let's go to owner investors? Okay, owner occupants, uh, keep your your uh, purchase con or the, the closing statement from when you purchase the property and uh, keep records of your improvements that you make on the property. And uh, what else? Uh, those are probably the big things that I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, for an uh, investor, it's different because you're going to have depreciation and you, you want to keep accurate records of your depreciation because you can, you know, depreciation on a, a rental property is 27.5 years. So if you buy a property a day and you sell it 15, 20 years from now, you might not have all those depreciation records and that can be a problem when you come to calculating your gain because the 
uh, depreciation is a annual deduction from your net income. And as that accumulates, that's called accumulated depreciation. So what you have over, for example, 10 years, uh, if you have $1,000 depreciation a year, and then you sell after 10 years, and you have $10,000 of accumulated depreciation, and that is subtracted from your basis. Your basis is the cost of the home plus improvements, and then you subtract depreciation, accumulated depreciation. If you don't have that information, that could trigger an audit if you don't include the accumulated depreciation in your calculations when you sell. So let's get this straight then. <clears throat> I'm an owner occupant. My cost, let's say I bought it for $300,000. Then I put 50,000 improvements into it. So now we got 250 grand basis then. And that's Correct. your cost basis, right? Correct. And then if I sell it for $500,000, then the gain, the tax on the gain is from three hundred fifty to 500000 Is that correct? Right. Yeah, so that'd now, be 150000 Right. Now, Potential capital gain. Yeah. So didn't Clinton, when he was president, get this one, not one time, but homeowner's exemption of a gain for single people and for married people? And how much is that deduction worth and tax-free money? I credit you for remembering who was the president at that time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the capital gain exclusion for single persons is 250000 and for married is double that, $500,000. The requirement is that you, out of the past five years, you must have lived there at least two years. So you could have lived there the first two years you bought the home, then rented it out for three, or vice versa, or you could have just lived there the whole five years. But you have to have had... Uh, Two years of residency. So if, if you're um, looking for the five hundred thousand dollar exclusion, then uh, both both persons, husband and wife, or whoever the two owners are, have had to live there at least two years. Now there's some are, there are some ex exceptions. They're very rare. I can't recall what they were offhand. I think it was you know like family issues and things like that where people were allowed to get the full capital gain exclusion. But I wouldn't rely on that. So the general rule is two out of the last five years at a minimum of residency. So let's take this house again. 350 grand with 300 basis, 50,000 sale, right? Mm -hmm. um, what happens is I sell it for 500, so 150 grand is free, tax-free, mm -hmm. right? Now, can I do that again and again? You can do that every two years. Wow. So after you sell it, you... You, you cannot take that exclusion again for two years. But, you know, if you're if you're selling the home today, and you can't take it for two years. If you buy another home today, then it's yeah. going to take two years of residency anyways before you qualify for the capital gain exclusion. So that means that you can do this every two years and report the gain and Uncle Sam cannot tax you. Uh, yeah, well, it's called an exclusion. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so that, that portion is excludable from taxable income. So you can do that every two years, yeah. every time, if mm -hmm. you have gains. Right. That's wonderful. That's better yeah. than the old tax law. It is. Probably yeah. nobody but you and me remembers the old <laughs> 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 Okay, and if they put any improvements, of course, that's deductible. It's not an expense, but you add it to the basis. Correct. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's two things that you can deduct from your personal residence. And I understand it was what your interest deduction and your property taxes. Are those the, are those the only two items that we can deduct on an annual basis from our tax returns? Uh, for for residents. Residents. yes. Yeah, that's all that come to mind. Those are the big ones. Okay. Uh, mortgage interest and property taxes. Uh, mortgage insurance also for people that have mortgage insurance. Oh. Uh, yeah, so those are deductible on Schedule A of your Form 1040. Okay, I didn't know that one. Okay, now let's go to investors then. So let's say the investor buys something for, say, 300000 again. Now, do you have to then determine as an accountant, as a homeowner, how much is attributable, attributable to the building portion and to the land portion? And why is that important in the depreciation scheme? Okay, land is not depreciable. So if you're an investor, uh, then you're only going to depreciate the building portion of the property. And that usually works out well, at least 
here in Hawaii because if you if your depreciation causes you to show a net loss, if you have such a large depreciation number that it's a net loss, that doesn't really do you any good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're you're close. You're better off just breaking even or having showing a small profit. And another thing is if you if you have that high depreciation, then when you go to sell the property, you're going to have a lower basis because you depreciated your accumulated depreciation is higher. And I've had some people uh, who have been really stung by that, that they they had their own accountant do it their way. And then they said, I just had this happen this, this year where they had their own accountant doing a high rate of depreciation. And then their basis was really low when they sold the investment property. So I was calculating their harp to refund. And it wasn't that much because, because uh, the basis was getting pretty low comparable com- compared to what they paid for it. So let's talk about the depreciation for investors because that's a huge tax deduction. So if I depreciate the building value over so many years, and I think you said 27 and a half years for residential property. That's but- right. I, is that 39 years for uh, non-residential property that you depreciate? You got me. I'd have to look it up. There, okay. there is a 39-year depreciation that applies to something, but I haven't done it in so long. Okay. So basically, <laughs> a rent, rental, residential rental, you're going to yeah. do 27.5 yeah. years. Okay. So let's say we've got 27 and a half years, okay, and we depreciated the full amount out, and then I sell it. So there's a gain on the purchase price to the sales price, but there's also a depreciation recapture then for the amount that you depreciated over the years. And a lot of people don't know that, do they? Yeah, they don't. So uh, we'll go on an extreme example. Let's say that you you buy a property and you own it for 28 years. So in that in that case, you fully depreciated the building though. Uh, so the land is not depreciable. That's included in the purchase price and, and you know, the purchase price includes the land and the building. So the building portion will be fully depreciated. And typically, uh, it, I kind of choose uh, the building value based on property tax records. I look at the ratio of the building to land. And sometimes if the land is too low, then I'll just, I'll just arbitrarily, you know, I'll, I'll come up with some formula and say maybe 50-50 or, or less because yeah I don't want to see somebody depreciating too much because what if you have like five thousand dollar loss every year that doesn't you know IRS might look at that and go why are you renting out a property and losing you know have showing a loss every year and then it comes back to bite you because after twenty eight years that assigned value on your building is is going to be zero so your basis will just be basically the land and perhaps any um, improvements that you made on the property, which add to your, increase your adjusted basis. Okay. So depreciation records are really important and the client has to tell you what they bought it at. And then you got to figure out, okay, at what value, what percent of the purchase is attributable to the building and to the land, and then keep an annual record of the depreciation that you've taken, right? That's, that's right. And over, it seems like it's not a big deal, but over you know, if, if people don't keep their tax returns and other information, 10, 15 years from now, they might have no idea. Mm. So now I've heard some people say, okay, let's go to the, you talked about the 1030 on exchange mm-hmm. as a means of uh, not not paying taxes, but actually deferring taxes. And that's the difference. It's not yes. tax-free, but it's tax-deferred. Uncle Sam will get the taxes sometime. That's right. But yeah. So are some people... Uh, they depreciate a building out completely and it's a really expensive property. Do they do an exchange just to avoid the depreciation recapture? They they do. But then, uh, as you ha- had mentioned, you're just, you're deferring it, which means right. you're postponing that capital gain. So if, you, you know, you, your uh, adjusted basis on this property is 100,000 and you, uh, you, uh, 1031 exchange it into another property. Let's say for for simplicity, let's say they're equal value. Then that other property would only be a hundred thousand dollar basis also. So when you sell it, it's not going to be a higher amount. It's going to be the same. Uh, 
yeah, so you're still going to be stuck with that low basis. So ultimately, if people uh, have, you know, if, if people are intend to pass property onto their relatives, then I would recommend they hang on to them. And when they pass away, then um, they get what they call. And what is the name of that? A step, step up in basis. Step up. Yeah. So then they have a step up in basis. And on the day that the owner passes away, the um, now a person inheriting the property isn't going to run out to an appraiser on the day that their loved one passes away. But they can they keep track of that date and then they call an appraiser and have the property appraised. And that will be their stepped up basis. And then whenever they sell it and and obviously, uh, you know, a home bought 30 years ago might have might have been a hundred thousand dollar price tag, which and it might be a million dollar now. So if somebody uh, has that stepped up basis, then they can sell the property and uh, have minimal or no capital gains tax. Okay, so let's go to this. This is really important that I think some people don't know. So you bought at 300000 it goes up to a million at the time of death of the parents. Mm -hmm. And then there's an appraisal done called death appraisal. And so it goes up to hundred grand on value. So the kids, the next year, sell it for a million. Mm -hmm. There was a gain from 300000 to a million, but mm -hmm. because you get a step up, the IRS says, hey, you sold it for a million, there's no tax. That's right. Is that right? Correct. Oh, wow. So we should tell yeah, our clients. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. That, that's, that's really good. And, you know, sometimes you'll see people going, now, if, if they need the money, they need the money, you know, the, the, the person, the owner of the house. But if they don't, sometimes they're thinking, I should sell this before I die, which is not a good tax strategy. It's better off to, to hold on to it, have it in a trust or, a, I guess, a very clearly written will. So everybody knows who, who's going to get the property. Right. And then they'll get the stepped up basis and uh, not have to pay taxes on it. So that's sale. really an important tax angle that you can give clients advice on, probably better than a normal Joe Blow realtor. Yes. <laughs> so I'm a firm believer. I always tell my agents, my, my clients, talk to a CPA because I know mm -hmm. enough to be dangerous, but I'm not a CPA. So you need to talk to a CPA, right? So, yeah, and I try and keep it, I just give them the basics because I don't want to stick my leg too far into the mud and get, you know, get tied <laughs> up on something later, you know, find out that uh, something didn't apply to their uh, particular situation. Sure. So really, real estate becomes a very complicated process if you are not careful and if you don't mm -hmm. keep records, right? Yeah. That's right. Okay, so I have a few more questions, Mike. Um, so we know there's taxes when you sell your personal residence, but 250 grand for a single person, half a million for a married couple, there's no tax. But then right. for the investor, if they sell something and it's appreciated, then if they sell that property, say from, they bought it for 300,000, sold it for a million, and then they buy something equal or higher in value, then they defer the taxes. Is that correct? If they do a 1031 exchange, Correct. yes. Yeah. Okay. Another okay. interesting thing that I'd like to add is that um, if, let's say, if they their property is, is they sell for a million, and but they don't want to buy something more expensive, hmm. then they can still do the 1031 exchange, but on the difference, they will pay the tax. So, for example, they sell a million dollar property and they, they roll it into a $900,000 property. It still qualifies for the exchange, but part of that, uh, sales proceeds will be subject to capital gains tax. Which be a little bit of best of both worlds because you got 900 grand that went into tax deferred or tax delayed and you pay tax on 100 grand, but hey, you got some cash. Right, and you can get the property you want and you're not just looking for something that costs more. Right, and I think you made a good point is that some people think that they can trade their exchange, their personal residence into an exchange and you cannot, is that right? Right. Yeah, because people say, oh, yeah, I'm going to um, you know, exchange. I'm going to move into that house. I tell them, excuse me, <laughs> you need to talk to an accountant because I don't think you can do that. And there's special rules about converting an investment property and exchanging it and then moving in and become your personal residence. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, there is no exact rule. But the rule of thumb is that if you do a 1031 exchange, so your investment property into another investment property, 
you, the new one, you should continue using it as an investment property for at least a year before you decide to move in and, and change it over to being a okay. Great. personal residence. Now, I've been told that we only have a few more minutes, but I want to talk about your love and your passion for dogs because okay. you, you donate a lot of money out of your commissions to a nonprofit called Hope for Dogs Rescue. Is that right? Yes. Tell me how that works. Okay, so Hope for Dogs Rescue is a nonprofit that uh, they, you can guess where a lot of the dogs come from. They come from the Waianae side because <laughs> they'll, they'll take dogs from, from anywhere. And even sometimes when people have to surrender them for various reasons. And uh, yeah, they have a lot of people who really care about dogs and they'll volunteer to take care of them and take them to the vet and get them healed up. And then they look for suitable uh, uh, new families and they interview the folks and they make sure that it's going to be a good fit. And uh, they have a lot of expenses because sometimes the dogs need uh, medical care and they, uh, they don't put any dogs down. You know, they'll, they'll try and keep every dog alive unless it's just beyond their time, but they won't put the dog to sleep though. Okay. And you donate part of your commission to Hope for yes. Dogs Rescue. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've taken a lot of pictures. Well, Mike sent, sent pictures to me and I posted on Facebook, say, thank you, Mike, for making another donation. And by the way, you have how many dogs? Uh, my, my own dogs, we have three. Uh, my big one is a great Dana. He gets all the attention and probably about two thirds of the people in Palola Valley. They might not know me, but they know my dog. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And besides that, I, I wish we had more time, but Mike's an avid surfer and he also has, he's an avid motorcyclist. And I've seen posts on Facebook about him riding around with a bunch of guys on a motorcycle. So Mike. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a pleasure and very informational. And I got to tell you, Mike is one of these that are really unassuming, really quiet, but very effective. And I really appreciate uh, working with Mike. If you want more information about Abley Seminars and want to know more about the school, please go to ableyseminars.com. And of course, share this uh, video with your friends and let them know that there's a really good video show on uh, real estate and taxes. And Mike Bates is our special guest. Mike, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Take care.